All right, so this will be the new selections of updates to the collection so far for this month. Uh, starting off with the single Criterion Edition, one I've been after for some time. Uh, it's not talked about a lot, but it's actually pretty elusive. This is Spine 74, the special CIV box set version of the classic Some Like It Hot. Uh, of course, this one carries a color cover, which is a really nice behind the scenes still, uh, whereas the CLV has a nice black and white cover. And uh, of course, while I obviously prefer the black and white cover or poster arc, this is a really nice, uh, you know, different identifier. And of course, back in the day, it was a really nice way to see uh, a different look for the film, you know, at least for box art and stuff. So it's really nice. And, and I like that they were getting away from, you know, the classic uh, blank background with just a random square or rectangle photo or still from the film representing it. So still classic Criterion design for jacket and box, but at least they're using full imagery for the cover. It's a hinged box with a typical Criterion insert. This one talking about, of course, the uh, TV safe areas and then the uh, color bars and then the uh, transfer and how you have to navigate the special features section. This disc does feature a nice audio commentary in addition to a nice little extras package, so I would recommend it over the CLV if you find it. Uh, but this one, even the CLV one isn't super common, but the CAV is even less common than the uh, CLV version. So if you're interested in this film on Laserdisc, I do recommend this. MGM did later come out with a pressing of their own. I'm, I'm sure it's either going to be the same transfer or the same element slightly improved. MGM would either just recycle the same transfer minus the extras later on, or they would do their own transfer of the same element, and it might be a little bit more spiffed up and polished. Uh, but of course, that's CLV only as opposed to this one. It does have a PCM mono track, and that is important because a lot of the later DVDs in the first Blu-ray were 5.1 only affairs, and Criterion has now put out the film again on Blu-ray, but you never know if these later mono tracks do get uh, scrubbed up a little too much, so uh, you can't count, out the, uh, can't count out the PCM mono just yet until you do a direct comparison. And I hope to do a direct comparison of this to the uh, Criterion Blu-ray and some of the others. Um, I had the old first Blu-ray, which, I mean, the image was okay, but it was 5.1 only, and this film does not need to be in 5.1. Uh, the supplement is pretty good. It is typical in the Criterion style. You get the, all the text and publicity stills and production stills, and then uh, there are some home movie selections. And I think most of this stuff was finally replicated on the... Uh, Collector's Edition DVD and now the Criterion Blu-ray, but of course this was the first edition that actually had the extras and is the only version on Laserdisc to do so. And you get the typical Criterion back with a really nice essay. So I do highly recommend this one and it's taken me a long time to find. I'm just very glad to finally have the CAV box version. Next up is from uh, a few discs I found in the local store. Uh, they had some really nice animated tiles mixed in, so I couldn't say no at the cheap prices they were at. Uh, this is the sixth and final volume of the Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle releases. Uh, so they did six of these with each a, um, a full episode per side. Uh, listed under the double feature funny stuff banner, so I, I, I I guess that's what they were going with for marketing. Uh, but you get these nice sort of uh, VHS star style era or VHS era style mock-ups of each episode with pretty nice art and then all six would match. Um, I don't know why they just did six and why they didn't decide to just do a box set instead of six individual ones. This is technically a Disney Buena Vista release, so the back looks a little bit familiar if you pay attention and their logo's down here. These do have PCM mono, and I'm excited to see what these look like because you never know with animation. Later releases can, uh, you know, change stuff, especially color, or um, you know, do a bit too aggressive of uh, cleanup work in picture and sound. So I never expected to pick any of these up. So this is this was a nice local find, and I like how Natasha's hidden here in the barcode. That's a pretty nice touch. Um, does have a little whole cut, saw cut here, so I guess it was a promo of some type or something. But uh, just really nice to find and uh, you know I don't know if I'll pick up the other five volumes uh, specifically but um, just excited to see what this looks like I haven't revisited these shows in a long time so this will be fun 
Moving on, here's another very difficult to find animated title. This from the Hanna-Barbera Hanna Personal Favorites line by Image, the release of Yogi Bear under the Personal Favorites banner. This was a collection that Image did of various Hanna-Barbera uh, cartoons and shorts that was uh, basically like a greatest hits package. But um, you know, a lot of these did not see very many or any more laser disc releases, and had only seen you know sporadic ones on tape by that point, which makes these you know very prized for animation fans who like you know more untouched transfers. They do have digital PCM sound. Uh, the color may be a bit different compared to later remastered versions, and of course they are, they are extremely rare and scarce. This one is not uh, on the super rare side, but say, for example, if you wanted to find the Scooby-Doo variant uh, of this personal favorites line, that one will cost you quite a bit. Uh, they also did one or two Johnny Quest releases uh, and I think a few others. So there's like maybe, I think it's about maybe 10 or 15 under this banner and all of them are pretty difficult to come by. Um, of course, they also simultaneously released on tape but it seemed like VHS was much more the market they were going to be catering to uh, because there were a lot more releases. All of them follow this similar jacket design and they were all image discs so they're all just the plain image jacket but with Hanna-Barbera characters all over the on the front and back. So I'm going to fire this up and check out the transfers to some of these. I'd love to find the Scooby one someday just to look at maybe a different older transfer of some of those. But basically these were the first you know cleaned up greatest hits uh, video release that you got for any of these characters. And then of course it was superseded by, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 different ones over the years. But uh, again, just a nice cheap local find that it was just, you, just something you don't see pop up in the bins very often. Oh, and it does have, again, the, the PCM mono, which of course is, you know, quite possibly gonna be better than what you get on even the remastered DVD versions. Now, next up, we're doing the couple for the director's shelves. Uh, this one I picked up on a lark. I've never seen the film, but I've always heard of it. I've seen little pieces of it, and I forgot that they actually got Arthur Penn to direct it. Um, I also picked it up at the, the local store, and it was only later that I realized this is actually one of those lasers that everybody likes to try and find, and it's actually quite difficult and uh, a little on the pricey side. So it was a very nice, uh, you know, pick up for a buck 50 so um this is the warner brothers uh actually this release is uh letterboxed i believe anyway this is the warner Bros. release of penn and teller get killed directed by arthur penn and like i said this is a laser disc that's actually pretty difficult to find it can be very pricey uh i think copies on the laser disc database and on ebay go for about 35 dollars or so so that was uh this is one i'm definitely glad i listened to my inner conscience and just went ahead and picked up instead of going oh no i'll think about it maybe maybe it'll be here next time i drop by and i'm like no, I should probably go ahead. <laughs> so thankfully for once, I listened to myself. Uh, beautiful, funny artwork on the front. And again, I had forgotten that Arthur Penn actually directed this. And I'm a big Arthur Penn admirer. So this will this will be a fun watch. Has a digital Dolby surround encoded surround track. And uh, I do believe this is widescreen. Um, I, I, mean, I could be wrong. It's a Warner jacket, and they're not really going to tell you at this era. Um, it could just be 133, or it could be, I don't know if this was a, I would guess this was a flat film, so it could be open map. But I believe this is actually widescreen. I looked it up on the database, and I just can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's widescreen. But anyway, uh, just a very nice, apparently super rare disc that I'm glad I picked up in the typical Warner art jacket on the back, which actually I have to say looks pretty good. And, uh, you know, I'm just glad I'm finally going to sit down and finally watch this all the way through. Next up is the underrated Scorsese picture, uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore from Warner Brothers. Uh, beautifully using original poster artwork. It's kind of scrunched into laser dimensions, but the printing and the detail on it is really nice. So uh, definitely a, a frameable disc, not a bunch of logos all over it. And uh, of course this is actually widescreen. It doesn't say so on the front, but they were nice enough to tell you on the back it's widescreen. Has a digital mono track, so no remixing fun going on here. Uh, this is an underrated film. It's kind of forgotten about. Um, 
Because, you know, Scorsese doing, you know, essentially what back in the old days would have been called the woman's picture or, you know, a, you know, a, a, a more down to earth drama. And it's actually very good. I, I, I probably would equate it in a lot of ways with Spielberg doing Sugarland Express about the same time period. Um, and that is also a phenomenally underrated film. Um, actually, I'd say Sugarland Express is one of Spielberg's best films still to this day. Um, and th this film, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, is actually really good every time you go back to it. It's, a, it's quite underrated. And it shows that Scorsese, you know, even at this point had uh, a knack for, you know, um, for character interplay and getting performances out of actors and things. So, you know, not every film has to be, you know, have over to the, over the top moments and, you know, great bits of slow-mo and great iconic, uh, bloody, <laughs> great iconic, uh, bloody, uh, you know, epic bouts of gusto. So uh, that's why this one I think is really kind of forgotten about and not talked about very often. But it's a nice laser disc. Uh, the only one you should really worry to pick up because all the other ones are going to be older pan and scan copies. And uh, they finally brought it out on DVD. And it's a pretty good DVD, uh, but it hasn't come to Blu-ray yet. So um, hopefully that's going to be a Warner Archive title at some point. But uh, if you're trying to build your Scorsese collection, this is one you can pick up pretty easily. It's not super expensive or anything, but uh, they didn't, I don't think they printed very many of them, so you don't come across it as often. So you'll have to spend a little time tracking it down, but it's not expensive. So uh, well worth it though, I would highly recommend it. Of course, talking about Spielberg, uh, we move on to what I think is probably his most underrated picture. Um, you know, I. I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Um, at least Sugarland Express does kind of have its defenders, but it does get talked about a whole lot. I would say that one or this one as his most underrated. This is the standard Warner Brothers letterbox release of Empire of the Sun. Beautiful, gorgeous uh, artwork from the original uh, one sheet poster. And of course, Warner Brothers decided no, we're just going to slap our big silver bar on the side. Uh, but don't let this fool you. This is actually widescreen. There is one of those nice uh, Warner CAV boxes, like for the color purple, that has the white uh, cover all over it. Um, I'd like to pick that up one day, but it's just the same transfer as this. Uh, but this has the, uh, I don't I think it's about maybe 45 minutes. I don't know if it's quite feature length, but there is a making of documentary called The China Odyssey, which is included on this version on the second disc with uh, PCM audio and everything. And uh, that is not on the CAV box. So if you're a really big fan of this film, you might as well just pick up both of them because um, the CAV one isn't expensive, but it's harder to find. And this one is a dirt cheap common disc. Uh, it does carry a fantastic Dolby Surround uh, PCM track. This film has a really great sound mix for 1987. Now the gatefold is just stunning. You get the chapter listing tucked in here. And then uh, side four, as I said, is the entire China Odyssey documentary. So it's, it's about 45 minutes to an hour long. But here, the rest of the gatefold is, is just a beautiful, beautiful image. And, you know, the, the way they chose this and the way they framed it and everything, it does seem, you know, reminiscent of Close Encounters and E.T., for example. Um, this, this is really an underrated film. It's, it's really, really good. If you've never seen it, I would definitely recommend it. It's not really for everybody, and it's definitely Spielberg trying to do his best David Lean impression. Uh, I don't know if it's just me being a gigantic David Lean fan that makes me predisposed to really like this, but um, it, it is a very good film. And honestly, I, I don't know if there's a Spielberg film really after this point that I really like as much as this. I mean, I, of course, like everybody else, I love Last Crusade, but I still have a lot of problems with it. Um, but I, I think about here, Empire of the Sun, Last Crusade, that's really where you start to feel a shift in like the tonality of Spielberg's work. So maybe it's just me. I don't respond to the, a lot of the later stuff as much. But um, I, I really do like this film. And this is a nice laser disc with a great soundtrack. And you get the documentary included as well. The transfer is also very good for the time. Um, it's you know roughly equivalent to the first uh, Snapper Case DVD, which I think is pretty much the same master, but with a 5.1 remix soundtrack. 
um, and it's out on Blu-ray with a nice digi book. But um, you know, still for for a laser disc, this is a nice title you can pick up for super cheap. I'll have to keep an eye out for the uh, CAV one someday, but. I think this is a really underrated film that's just not talked about hardly at all. It never gets mentioned, so um, really excited to fire this one up. Now going from talking about a film I really, really love and think is a, a completely underrated to a film I really, really despise and I think is extraordinarily overrated, yet I still bought a copy of it because I have problems, <laughs> obviously. So uh, going to... Uh, of course, Mr. QT himself. Uh, this is the live home video Miramax release of Reservoir Dogs, which technically should just be called City on Fire, the remake. That was not credited as the remake. Now, of course, as I really don't like this film, you may ask why I bought a copy of it. Well, I, I like things in this, and my big problem with this film is that it didn't acknowledge that it's technically a City on Fire remake, uh, not to mention that it steals the outfits and the composition of the characters in the black suits uh, for Have a Better Tomorrow too. but that's that's another thing entirely. Um, you know, I, I you know I like things in this. I acknowledge that it was a different style, but you know I just felt like it was really unfair and you know complete plagiarism to take somebody else's work and not give them credit for it, even if you change some things here and there, um, and cut off the whole first half of the the drama, so you cut out a lot of character. Um, but anyway. Uh, you know, this film is a lower budgeted film. It does have, you know, a limited sound mix. So if I wanted to watch this, I would like to watch a copy with, you know, no tomfoolery going on. And Tarantino is known for going in and while supervising home video transfers, you know, tweaking things here and there, tweaking the sound mix, you know, uh, raising the color saturation, messing with contrast and stuff. And, um, you know, the, the Pulp Fiction box is pretty nice. That's why I have the, the Criterion box. And I don't mind Pulp Fiction the way I do this because this is totally City on Fire. <laughs> and I love City on Fire. But, um, you know, I, I occasionally feel like rewatching this every once in a proverbial blue moon, which is very rare. Um, so, and also since uh, there's a lot of Tarantino fans, people will buy the Laserdisc if they see it somewhere, which uh, drives up uh, value and stuff. And then you just don't find them very often so I figured since this was you know super cheap and in pretty pretty good shape I figured I might as well plus I know it's supposed to have one of the worst side breaks ever uh, the database says it as soon as I talked about it on one of the live one of my last live streams that's what everybody said so I figured I had to check it out simply for that it's supposed to I believe have a side break in between um, Somebody asks a question, and then there's a side break, and then on the next side, somebody answers. And I could totally picture Quentin Tarantino uh, insisting that it be right there just to be kind of <laughs> kind of screw with the audience, be like, yeah, put the break right there. Yeah, it's great. Totally takes you right out of the movie. And I'm like, yeah, I could see somebody. I could see him doing that. Anyway, uh, it's just a standard movie-only disc, again, with a... Uh, it does have the Dolby Surround moniker, so they did at least pay for the license. So it is a Matrix stereo PCM surround track, which should be the original mix without any remixing. And there's a lot of 5.1, 6.1 remixes on later DVDs and stuff. So that's why I wanted to pick up the Laserdisc of that and to see the infamous side break for myself. Um, you know, and I, I go on and on and on and on and on about how I don't like Reservoir Dogs because it ripped off City on Fire. But, you know, if if you don't, if you're not looking at that, yes, it, it's, it's a well made enough. I don't think it's perfect. It's got interesting things in it and good performances, but it's also totally City on Fire. <laughs> so I, I don't feel that I can reiterate that enough times because as the years go on, more and more people forget or have never heard of the fact that he wasn't simply referencing other films in this movie. He was literally ripping one off. And I'm almost convinced that because he had uh, Miramax on his side and because it was a Chinese film from Hong Kong from the late 80s, that's how they got away with it because if it had been an american picture from any time they would have been sued immediately um, so anyhow um all that aside that's why i picked this up and uh again these aren't rare but because there are so many tarantino fans and so many people like this movie they'll simply buy it to frame it even if they don't have a player and stuff so i figured well i might as well while there's actually one in front of me 
Now on the flip side, you may think that I don't like Tarantino at all, but no, there's w there's one exception, one very big exception, and uh, that's a the next disc I picked up. I've been trying to find this for a while. This is the standard EC3 letterboxed edition of Jackie Brown, which is the one Tarantino film I actually really love. Um, I, I think this is the one time he made a darn good movie, um, and it's something I can watch and enjoy, and I don't have a million problems with. Uh, uses the this was one of the main original one sheets as far as I could tell you know it's pretty basic but it looks nice on a laser disc jacket of course there's a DTS variant that's exceptionally rare and expensive and everything and for the cost of that you could buy like I don't know maybe 50 copies of the AC3 version um, it's also on DVD and Blu-ray, uh, which I have those and uh, you know those are good transfers have extras and things but I think the Blu-ray, the transfer looks like uh, QT may have gone in and tweaked a few things. Like the color's really saturated and it just looks kind of iffy in the way that Pulp Fiction can in some scenes. So I wanted to check out the Laserdisc and I, I love this film anyway. So I always wanted to at least pick up this um, AC3 version, which is pretty cheap, but you just don't ever find it anywhere. At least I haven't. It is a Miramax title, so this is technically a Disney disc. Unfortunately, there's no gatefold, so it's just two discs shoved in here. There's a little side crumpling and stuff, but it's not bad, and the cover has some nice gloss to it. Unfortunately, there's no real extras. You do get the film spread across three sides, and again, there is a uh, Dolby D Digital AC3 track in addition to the Matrix PCM. And Dolby surround track. So uh, this laser just will give you the 2.0 matrix audio if you're interested in comparing um, that to the AC3. And again, it's it's a cheap disc, but I just have never found it. So I'm just very happy to have finally stumbled across it. And um, I'm actually very interested to fire it up and, and see what the transfer looks like because I always am I'm kind of down for rewatching Jackie Brown because it's again, it's the one film of his that I really, really enjoy. Um, I, I, I like most Elmer Leonard uh, adaptations, actually, very strangely. I haven't read a lot of Leonard, and I know that this and, uh, you know, Get Shorty, for example, they make a lot of changes, but I think they do get, you know, a lot of the spirit in there, which which is really what you're supposed to do in an adaptation. So um, I, I really do enjoy both of them, and uh, I'm just excited to finally pick this one up. Of course, I'd love the DTS one if I ever find it and it doesn't cost me like 85 bucks or something. But um, this will this will be nice to go along with the DVD and Blu-ray, both of which are super cheap. The DVD has some really nice packaging, I must say. Moving on to a uh, nice little double feature set of two noir uh, masterworks. This is the MCA Universal Encore double feature and the tradition of some of the other Encore double features of The Killers and Crisscross, Cross, two uh, classic noirs directed by Robert C. Mack, both starring Burt Lancaster. Um, just uh, two fantastic noirs. The Killers is one of the great, well-known, classic, definitive noirs. Crisscross Cross isn't talked about as much. It's not as well-known. It's not in as many of, you know, the big noir texts, but it is a great little noir. It's one of those that you don't immediately think of off the top of your head but every time you rewatch it or you come back to it you think about it again you're like oh wow you know i forgot how really good this is and of course there's you know dozens and dozens and dozens almost hundreds of noirs like that you do get a really nice gatefold with a entire essay about each film and then the chapters for each film so basically each film is given a panel this is uh, basically matching the uh, universal double features for some of the later uh, classic horrors or the uh, two uh, western encore double sets that i have so they did more of these double feature sets than you'd think but they really didn't you know like number them or anything so you realize there's a lot of these double feature sets but um, these are all really nice because you know they were later transfers early to mid 90s they all have digital mono so these have pcm mono but these films have their theatrical trailers at the end and they're on separate disc which is nice because you know, it's, it's just kind of always weird when you're watching a uh, multi-feature set and you got to literally go from one movie smack into another one. And here you get this nice cover with, again, each each film given its own section, so it, its own era of importance. And then the background is sort of this, uh, I guess it's supposed to be like graffiti on a back alleyway. So that I guess that's a nice touch, you know. 
and uh, I'm just excited to check this transfer out. I've tried to pick this up for a long time. It just kept eluding me. It's uh, thankfully not rare and not super expensive, but th this copy is in great shape. And again, I wish Universal had done more of these. Um, and of course, they never reissued their classic horrors that they did as the first encores with analog only sound and stuff um, like and then the ones that they did reissue they were just the same old <laughs> like I was so excited to find the revamped Encore Dracula only to find out it was the same as the old late 80s one just with a new cover and I'm like oh dang it <laughs> so um, I'm just really excited whenever I find one of these because these these were really nice reissues of all of these for the for the um you know, encores that they actually did in the mid 90s. I think this one for, was from about uh, 94 or 95, actually. It's getting later on in the encore years. All right, here is a RKO Classic Collection disc I picked up. Um, this one, of course, is going to be controversial simply due to the nature of the uh, performers, but this is actually not a super common one. This is the single Amos and Andy film, uh, Check and Double Check, which I've never really heard a lot about. I knew that Amos and Andy were, you know, a big, uh, you know, uh, radio comedy duo, and I knew they had been in some films. I just didn't know what they were really. Uh, but this was apparently the one film that they were in together. I think this was about 1930 or so and uh, the cover should explain why it's pretty obvious this would be controversial today uh, the fact that you know the duo is performing entirely in blackface and that's the whole film um, uh, apparently I believe this was pretty successful back in the day so I don't know why they just did one film um, because it was a hugely long uh, super long running radio series um, but yeah this is the single film they did so um, again I, I kind of made a mission to pick up any RKO discs whenever I find them because a lot of them uh, were never put out on DVD and I'd love to have a complete set of RKO classic discs like some fine folks do and I'm very envious of those <laughs> collections um, so this is just one step closer and it's not a super common one and again you know for historical importance it should be an interesting watch uh, does have a digital mono track and I guess this was a promo copy at some point because it has a hole punch in it but um, yeah, just one step closer to uh, RKO completeness and uh, just a film that I had only like heard obscure mentions of. Here's another RKO classic disc. This is a classic noir. Um, well, I don't know if I should say classic noir, but a lot of people view this as probably what could be argued as the first true film noir in terms of style, tone, and everything. Uh, from 1940, this is the classic Stranger on the Third Floor, uh, which is a fantastic atmospheric film if you've never seen it. Um, you know, a great, great early Peter Lorre film for his career over here in the States on the screen. Because um, even though he'd come over here and done things like Mad Love in 1935 and Crime and Punishment in 36, um, you know, he would just, um, you know, just keep working away at it. But it really wasn't until... He was in this film, and then, of course, in The Maltese Falcon is what really pushed him into being one of Warner Brothers' main character actors for a good long time. Uh, but anyway, uh, a lot of people argue this is one of those films you could argue as the first film noir. Um, some people say it's The Maltese Falcon. Some people say this film uh, because it predates it by a year. Uh, but it does have a lot of the noir styles, and the story is very noir-esque. So I can I, I, I can go with, with that assumption that this is probably one of, if not the first American film noir as the genre later came to be known. So I'm very happy to find this on Laserdisc. Again, I don't think this one is super common. It has a digital mono track. And while this is out on DVD, it's not even super easy to find on DVD. So, and I've been re wanting to rewatch this for ages. So this will be a nice watch. And uh, I always love seeing um, these RKO discs because, you know, usually the transfers are of whatever was in the vault they got to pull out. And it's just straight up, no frills. And it's like 
honestly it's like running your own print in a weird way and i love stuff like that so uh this will this will be exciting to spin up so great film if you've never seen it highly recommended now next up from 1943 is uh, a, a film that is very important historically this is the mgm ua release of cabin in the sky uh, which is the adaptation of the uh, Broadway musical. And this is directed by Vincent Minnelli and is, you know, the, it's really interesting because, you know, this is a positive portrayal uh, of, uh, you know, black characters played by black actors. And it's ex exactly as it was on the stage, you know, done with full MGM weight behind it in terms of production and you have Vincent Minnelli doing the directing who was a great director um, so even though I'm not really one for musicals um, you know just for historical importance this is really huge and uh, Warner's put it out on DVD uh, I think about maybe 10 years or so ago and then there were some nice new articles about it and I'd heard of the title I just didn't know what it was so that's really when I became aware of it and uh, what it was actually about <laughs> And uh, so I saw it once back then, and I've uh, you know caught glimpses on random TCM airings. So um, I hadn't even realized that it came out on Laserdisc. So this is a nice uh, MGM release, and I don't know if there's an earlier one. There may be, but um, this is a nice air disc from their uh, early '90s era. Even though it doesn't say on here that it has digital sound, I think it actually does or at least the database says it does. I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this has a digital mono track. If not, the analog mono should still sound pretty good. And of course, this is in Technicolor, so um, I'd be very interested to check out the transfer on this. This copy's in great state, still in the shrink wrap. And again, uh, simply for historical importance, uh, this film is extremely important and extremely well made and you know also produced by Arthur Freed who is behind all of the great big classic MGM musicals so um, you know important stage property with the full might of MGM and that the you know heyday of their musical might uh, behind it so um, if you're a musicals person you probably already know about this or if you're a big Broadway person you probably already know about this but um, yeah, definitely important for historical reasons and as an important musical. Um, so I'm excited to actually kind of go back and rewatch this and check out the uh, Technicolor on this Laserdisc. Next up from 1945, this is an underrated film, I think. This is the Hepburn Tracy co-starring vehicle Without Love. This was, I believe, the third film they were in together after uh, Woman of the Year and Keeper of the Flame. Then there were a couple years where they did other things and then uh, came back for this MGM film, which is really kind of interesting. It's, I mean, I, it's it's not their most well-known co-starring film. Uh, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd probably say, you know, Woman of the Year or Adam's Rib would be the best of those. Maybe Death Set, that's also, you know, very well loved. But this one is kind of, that gets forgotten. Uh, it has a lot of great little bits in it. And of course, they have a dog and that automatically makes it great. Um, and I, I love the dog's role in this film. It has this weird, uh, this weird character um, where Spencer Tracy's character is a sleepwalker and so that's why he has this little dog to catch him in sleepwalking so anyway this is just a delightful little film it has an, actually has a gatefold which is rare for single disc MGM UA titles beautiful beautiful stills and again even though this is tinted in the way they would usually do it it looks really really nice on here so I'm exceptionally glad they gave this a gatefold Again, it's very rare for MGM to not do a gatefold if they didn't have to, but I guess they were sort of doing this. Um, they did do all of the uh, Hepburn Tracy films they had the rights to and sort of like slightly more special editions. Uh, there's the double, the one's double feature set, and then the uh, there's another one that's another film with a um, with the. I think it's from the mid 90s documentary about uh, the two of them. So I guess this one was done kind of to match that. So they decided it would earn a gatefold. It does include the original trailer. And again, it's it's a much nicer laser disc release than you would expect this film would get because it's really the one that's kind of forgotten about um, of their you know more well-known films because there is one film they made that is extremely forgotten about. Um, 
That being the second film they made, Keeper of the Flame, which is a very, very strange picture. Uh, it, uh, it didn't come out on Laserdisc. It finally came out on DVD, and you can actually get it in the... Um, uh, they did a uh, multi-studio set that actually put all their films together finally. And that, that film is really bizarre to see for the first time. You can see why it didn't do very well. Most people don't talk about it. Most people don't know about it. Uh, that film is basically, it starts out like it's going to be a comedy, then it turns into a film that's very reminiscent of Rebecca, and then almost has uh, noir overtones for the rest of it, and has a really dark ending, so <laughs> it's really strange. Um, so I can't say this is the film of theirs that is forgotten about, because that one nobody knows about. Um, but yeah, this this is an underrated little, little gem, and it's really fun to watch. Uh, it does really have that, uh, you know, World War II post-war vibe because it was made during the war. Um, of course, their characters are involved in wartime projects, developing things for the army. Um, so even though it came out in 1945, you get that whole feeling of it still being for the war effort. And... Uh, Yes, that does look like Katie Hepburn is wearing a fishbowl on her head. So it does have really quirky stuff in it. Um, either a fishbowl or like the prototype for Dr. No's control room helmet. So, um, but yeah, this is an interesting little gem. Um, if you're into screwball comics at all or uh, uh, Katie Hepburn or Spencer Tracy or the both of them, um, you know, this, of course, is perfect. Really nice laser disc release, I have to say. And it's pretty much, it seems like it's the same transfer as the DVD, so um, should be pretty equivalent to that. Now next up, it, from 1953, is another one of these really nice Columbia Award winner jacket uh, releases that they did on Laserdisc. And even though not all these transfers are really spiffed up, sometimes they just put the award jacket on. Uh, you know, if it was an Oscar winner or a very iconic film, um, you know, at least the jackets were really well done. And I'd argue this is probably the first decent release this film had on home video because it does have a digital mono track. But of course, this is the 1953 classic From Here to Eternity with just fantastic artwork. I mean, for this film, if this is not what you're putting on the front cover, you're doing everybody a disservice because this is what everybody remembers. Uh, this film has so many great moments in it, so many great performances, but this, the iconic uh, kiss on the beach sands with the crashing waves, I mean, especially if you ever get the chance to see this film in a theater at a revival showing or an art house, that scene still plays. I mean, there is a reason why, you know, this is arguably the most iconic uh, clinch, as they would used to call it, you know, when the male and female leads had their passionate embrace and kiss, you know, they used to call it the clinch, uh, you know, but that, that there, there's good reason why this is probably the most iconic kiss in all of screen history, even though, you know, there are great contenders. This is the one that still, even if you've never seen the film before, I mean, it just hits you every freaking time, uh, you know, and the fact that it's in black and white and the composition, the editing, everything. So this is easily the best cover for the film on any home video format. And as good as the Blu-ray is, and it is really great, and Sony's done a great job at trying to restore the film, uh, it, this, this cover's fantastic. And, of course, you get it printed on a Laserdisc jacket. has a nice gloss to it and everything, so easily very frameable. And I really like the uh, award design they gave to all of these jackets, so they all match. As I said before, it carries a digital mono track, and it fits in with the design of all the other jackets, so they all go together. Here is an original uh, ad sheet for the film, one of the original posters, you know, hyping up the fact that it's based on, you know, the super important best-selling novel, which, of course, they had to make a lot of concessions for bringing it to the screen in 1953, but all that considered, it's an exceptional adaptation with phenomenal performances and, uh, you know, directed by Fred Zeneman, who is one of the great unheralded directors. And now that I have a lot more laser discs, I think I'm going to have to make a uh, Fred Zeneman section on my director's shelf. Um, but again, uh, really nice. First really good release of this film, I'd argue, on home video. Um, going to much supersede all the other ones. Really the only good addition on Laserdisc. So I uh, picked this one up, and then the first DVD was based off of uh, this restoration attempt. So I think they're roughly similar, and uh, but the Blu-ray is best of all because they've, uh, of course... Uh, digital uh, restoration tools have come so far in the time period and that is really the best way to watch the film at home. Uh, if you've never seen it before it is one of the great um, uh, 
I mean, it's not really a war film, but you know, it deals with so many, I, I, you know, so many elements of the war because it is like right before the Pearl Harbor attack. So, um, you know, it, it, it is a war film, but it isn't a war film. It's more of an army film or an interpersonal relationships in the midst of uh, the outbreak of war film. If that, if that's a genre. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it but it is a great one, and every time you come back and rewatch it, it 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 reminds you of that very quickly. Speaking of super iconic releases, and in this Columbia Pictures Award jacket design, uh, this is one I've tried to pick up for a while, simply because this is simply one of the great films, and I wanted to check out the Laserdisc version. This is of course the Columbia Award release of On the Waterfront, again perfect choice of still for the cover whoever did these jackets uh, knew what they were doing this is the scene everybody knows even if they've never seen the film they know the taxi cab scene they know i the i could have been a contender speech um so this is what you need to put on the cover of this film if you're not using the original artwork um you know which the original poster is pretty good but this is what everybody knows this is what everybody remembers um so as much as i like this sort of arty design of the the criterion blu-ray this is what should be on the cover so again this is an example of columbia getting it right back in the day and this is the best cover for this film on all the various releases i mean the dvd is pretty good but it's sort of a photoshop montage thing uh this th th this is simple classy and all you need to put on the jacket of this um if you've never seen on the waterfront it, it, you, you just need to go see it like now <laughs> it, it it is that important um you know it, it influenced so many people and um you know it's it's importance when it was released in 1954 is just enormous uh it still packs a wall up today you get a really nice Criterion style uh, essay here. Has a digital mono track, of course. Uh, this is presented in 133. The film was in the early days of widescreen, so uh, the early versions were in 133. Uh, the DVD was 185. Um, theaters have showed it different ways. I've seen it uh, projected widescreen. I've seen it projected 133. Criterion's Blu-ray allows you to choose between 133, 166, and 185. And I really like the 166 uh, ratio in between, uh, but I don't think you can really go wrong with any of the three. Um, I don't really know what the intended ratio was. Even though it was 1954, it should technically have been designed for 185, and I think it's fine in widescreen. Um, but I really like that 166 if I'm going to watch the Criterion Blu-ray. But of course, the way I first saw it was in 133, so um, any of those are, are, are fine, really. But um, this is the version to pick up if you're wanting to get it on Laserdisc. All the earlier versions are just analog only with uh, not as good transfers. And of course, um, this being one of the gems of the Columbia Library, Sony has been continually uh, trying to better its uh, restoration efforts on it. So. Uh, pick up the Criterion Blu-ray set uh, to see the best home video version. Um, but of course, the Laserdisc has a nice mono PCM track of its own and is a really nice transfer with a great jacket. Next up, we're going to move on to a couple of horror titles I picked up. This one is one to check off of the classic Universal Horrors, one of the few Encore discs of theirs that have a digital soundtrack. This is the 1943 Technicolor remake of The Phantom of the Opera in the Encore jacket. Again, the big draw here is that it has a digital mono track, whereas most of these Encore editions, at least for the first couple years when they released the big titles of classic horrors, uh, were analog only. Of course, this is a Technicolor film, so it, the transfer here is not going to be as good as later ones. Um, but of course, if you saw this film on tape like I did originally, you'll know uh, the sort of softer transfer it used to have. But I'm really excited to actually check this out. I'm curious to see what this transfer looks like on Laserdisc and see, you know, check out what the uh, increased resolution looks like over tape. Uh, of course, they cleaned it up a little bit more for DVD, and then the Blu-ray actually looks quite nice. Um, unfortunately, for all the money they threw at this, uh, it's really kind of dull. Um, uh, Claude Rains is great, of course, but the Phantom is underused, and they made him a sympathetic character this time around, which 
Um, I mean, I don't mind that, but, you know, it seems much more like the Phantom is a fatherly character instead of the, uh, you know, really kind of messed up dude that he's supposed to be. And, uh, you know, it's, it's much more about the costumes and the sets and the technicolor and the singing. And it's like, okay, we get it. Um, but you know, if, if push comes to shove, if I have to choose between seeing this and one of the multitudes of versions of the, uh, Cheney original silent film, I'm going to go with the Cheney original silent film, whether it's the uh, 1925 version, the 1929, uh, pro partial sound, uh, reshot version and, or one of the many re edits of that film, because, uh, as any Phantom fan will tell you, it's extremely impossible to see the original 1925 version without a lot of compromises. Uh, and if you get into that film, there's actually more like like 7 or 10 or 15 different versions. And then you have all the different restorations. So as many problems as that film has, and as many cuts as that film has, it's still a more entertaining watch than this film. But this film has a lot of good stuff in it. And when Claude Rains is on the screen, he's great, as always. Um, but it is kind of a long film and it does kind of drag so um not 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 the best of the classic universal horrors but just one i wanted to uh you know check off the list since i'm trying to pick up at least all the ones that have digital soundtracks now being an encore disc it does have the same style of jacket it does actually include the theatrical trailer which is nice that universal seems to really like trotting out this uh color remake a lot it's gotten released on every format uh when some of the other classic horrors haven't so i don't know if they if they think they make a lot more money off of this one for some reason and they don't even like to even acknowledge the 25 original um which they leave to other people to you know try and restore and stuff uh but they'll they'll sell you another copy of the 43 phantom i, I know i've at least owned like six or seven or maybe ten copies of this film over the years they literally trot it out in every box set and every format and people think it's the cheney film then they put it in and they get halfway through and they're like what the heck is this this is boring um which i have to say was my reaction as a child i got the vhs tape and i was so excited and i was like wait a minute <laughs> i've been misled however they carried on in this formula and made even more boring costume drama films sold as horror films um so this really kind of started a mini cycle there are films later on like the climax where they got boris karloff um under contract for a little while and those really really drag it's like hey our phantom uh, remake made a lot of money but it wasn't boring enough. Let's make one that's more boring with no phantom. Yeah, that's a good idea, uh, said nobody with a brain. <laughs> but I digress. Anyway, um, so this is a nice little encore disc. It shouldn't cost you a whole lot if you're going for uh, completion on the classic Universal Horrors. And again, it's one of the few earlier ones that actually has a digital mono track. And as you know, with the classic Universal Horrors, uh, basically any release can have like differences from you know like drop frames or all kinds of stuff or you know when they do another restoration it might cause changes and stuff so basically you get to a point where if you're really a fan of some of these films that have been put through the ringer for decades that uh, it's maybe not a bad idea to just go ahead and collect all the versions you can get your hands on and then that way you can just examine them for yourself <laughs> Uh, next up are two double feature sets from Orion that uh, comprise four films in the uh, renowned classic Roger Corman American International Poe cycle. Uh, these are really, really well done. I've always wanted to pick some of these up, but it never dawned on me that they are actually done in uh, sequential order and all the covers match. And they, the image in, or sorry. Image and Orion really put some effort into, you know, making these nice for, you know, the fans of these films and horror collectors and stuff because they're really, really well done. This is the double feature of The Premature Burial and Tales of Terror. And again, uh, these are going in sequential order. So you can pick up the first set with uh, House of Usher and Pit and the Pendulum and then go in uh, chronological order. They are in widescreen, which is the first time these films were offered in widescreen. Which is very important because these films were known for being you know some of the first low budget especially the first films for AI, for aip to not only be in technicolor but to also be in proper widescreen and not just just be you know cheap flat films or 133 so the fact that these films were almost often seen pan and scan was really a damn shame because they were iconic for their widescreen composition 
Uh, Premature Burial is an interesting film. It's the one film in the series that doesn't uh, have Vincent Price as the star because Corman was trying to get away from AIP, and so he cast Ray Milan because Vincent was under contract to AIP, so he couldn't use him. And then AIP comes along and buys out the company rights and stuff, basically takes over the company. So then it's like they're partners again, and he's already started working with Ray Milan, so he could have made it with Vincent anyway, but it had already gotten a bit further. But it's a, it's an, actually an interesting, nice change, and Milan is great. Um, in a lot of ways, it kind of reworks what they did with uh, the previous film in uh, Pit and the Pendulum in terms of the whole... Um, you know, expanding Poe into a full narrative subplot, but it's it's really well done. It's got a nice dark tone to it, you know, and like the other sub films in the series, it has the color-tinted nightmare sequence, so it fits right in with the rest of them. But because it doesn't have Vincent Price in it, it's one that doesn't get talked about a lot, or most people haven't seen, or don't realize it's part of the cycle. Whereas Tales of Terror was the attempt at changing things up, it's three short pieces, three opposed short stories crammed together into a feature. Um, and while not all of them are successful, the second one really is where they introduce the element of comedy. And that's the one where you have the immortal wine tasting scene between Vincent Price and Peter Lorre and the Black Cat segment. And the success of the comedic tone was what inspired them to go ahead and do the full all out comedy, The Raven, afterwards. Um, but again, with these, you get really nice gatefolds with uh, well-chosen stills with funny little captions for uh, each film on its own panel. And uh, it's all spread across three sides, so you know you will have to watch one film and then go right into the other or navigate through side two to um, get to the second film if you want to watch that by itself. But you know, I, I don't I don't really mind that because you know they were really trying to you know do these films justice on these releases. And now I really want to pick up the other ones because until I got this in my hands, I didn't really know just how much care had been put into these. Um, and again, really nice write-ups for both films. And uh, again, you get digital mono tracks and actual scope Panavision widescreen for the first time. So really, really nice. And these films are extremely important in the annals of classic horror. Well, just horror in general. Of course, here's a second one I picked up, which is the double feature set of the aforementioned The Raven. Uh, paired with The Mask of the Red Death, which is, in my opinion, probably the best film in the cycle and uh, probably uh, Corman's best film overall and one of Vincent Price's greatest performances, so I can't sell it highly enough. Um, and again, The Raven is a fun, fun romp, really. It's, uh, you know, it takes the, the Poe title and the famous poem and then does its own thing entirely, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so it's it's not meant to be taken fully seriously. And again, you can see the cover design matches the uh, other disc set. So you could have all these on the shelf or put them on a table side by side or frame them and they all go together. Again, for the first time, these films were offered with uh, their PCM monotracks and finally in widescreen. And that is especially is important for Mask of the Red Death because that was the first film Corman shot in the UK. Uh, he had a uh, higher budget and uh, access to better sets and things. And it was the film where he was really trying to, you know, uh, stretch himself creatively. And he also got uh, Nicholas Rogue as his cameraman. This was when Nick Rogue was one of, you know, the most in-demand uh, cameramen in England. And he was a fantastic cameraman before he ever became a director. So there's brilliant widescreen color photography in Mask of the Red Death. And I first saw it on a pan and scan tape, which was all, darn right, downright criminal because it was just a, a mess. And I couldn't even understand what was going on because the panning and scanning was so bad. And so finally seeing it in widescreen on DVD was just a revelation. And uh, then, of course, that was uh, preceded by this. Of course, now the film is not really available here. Shout Factory put it out in their first Vincent Price Blu-ray set, but that went out of print, and it's not really available in Europe anymore. There was some nice, uh, there's a nice German release. Um, it's not available in the UK, so it's got some rights troubles going on. Um, so now you have to go get the out of print Blu-ray, or pay a ton of and pay a ton of money, or get the old DVD, which you could still get for not not too much, or pick up this laser disc. And the other thing I should mention, there's a couple little trims in Mask of the Red Death, very tiny things, but the fans of the film know about them, and uh, it's reputed that this laser disc is one of the um, 
only additions to have those in there. Uh, the other one is supposedly the uh, Koch Media German release, which is, uh, of course, out of print, as I mentioned. Uh, the US DVD and Blu-ray are based off the MGM Master that doesn't have them, apparently. Um, I don't know if that means this is a totally different transfer from the MGM DVD, because most of those seem to reuse these uh, Orion era transfers, but um, I'm really excited to check this out and see if that's true, if it has some of those missing frames in there. Again, really, really nice gatefold. What's really cool is you get these neat little captions that, you know, explain this is a Jeremy Lobby card, and then some of these have, you know, funny little captions to some of the more uh, horror-tastic shots chosen. Again, uh, the films are on four sides here, and so you actually can uh, just separate the discs and watch one film at a time if you so desire. Really great write-ups again on the back. Again, these are just really, really nice. I, I love the quality of these, and you can really tell. Like, you just pick it up, and you can feel somebody really cared about doing these films justice. Because, like I said, this was the first time you could see these in widescreen, and it is super important for these because, you know, that was one of their big selling points. Um, but if you've never seen any of these, or you're a big Vincent Price fan, the, the one I can't recommend highly enough is Mask of the Red Death. Uh, you know, Corman even acknowledged, you know, he's trying to have some uh, Bergman references, which is pretty obvious, you know, when you have the hooded figure of death wandering around. It's very Seventh Seal. Um, but it's, it's a very dark film. It's got a lot of adult content, but it's also got a lot of sly humor in it. So it isn't just pure doom and gloom. It isn't pure scares. Um, and they're finally getting away from, you know, the, um, yeah, I mean, there is a walk down a corridor like some a lot of the earlier films, but it's not a long walk down a long, dark corridor with spooks and things that go in the night and stuff like that. So they're finally starting to really work with the formula. They did the comedy thing, and now they're really, with Mask of the Red Death, it's like they're trying to be, you know, taken more seriously. And I think the move to England really caused that. Uh, unfortunately, they only made one more film after that, uh, Tomb of Lygia, which is also quite exceptional, also shot in England, um, but that was the final film in the cycle. But anyway, a really nice release, not super expensive, but again, you don't come across these every day. And I really want to pick up the rest of these Orion, um, you know, AIP classic Corman Poe releases. <laughs> I also did the uh, letterbox edition of the Fives films, so I'd love to pick that up too because I'm sure it's comparable to these Poe discs. Now, last up are two box sets, um, also you know horror related. This one, I mean, it's under the sci-fi matinee banner, but uh, you know some of these are kind of somewhat sold under the horror genre, so I, I guess I can kind of just um, you know include it in there, but. Um, I always kind of wanted to pick this up. It's it's not um, super rare, but it usually goes for a nice dollar amount. So this was a, you know, it's it's a little worn, but it was a nice cheap copy. This is the United Artists Sci-Fi Matinee box set, and the first of two volumes they did. Uh, this one is the more common one. It has uh, four films tucked in here in the typical MGM UA box style. Uh, the real reason why I wanted to pick this up is it has The Man from Planet X, which is an interesting, not often talked about uh, sci-fi film from the early 50s during the, you know, aliens and monsters craze. Uh, but it was directed by Edgar G. Ulmer, who was a great underrated director who had worked under all the greats over at UFA during the heyday of German cinema in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it came over here and made the Black Cat for Universal, which was, you know, famously uh, reshot, recut because it was way too dark. And there's so much darkness and weird, adult, morbid dark stuff in there, even in the cut down, censored, reshot version. That uh, that combined with the fact that um, he kind of really uh, pissed off the head office, really kind of made him persona non grata in Hollywood for a long time. So he went to just uh, working for the uh, cheap Poverty Row Studios, cranking out uh, really cheap, you know, ostensibly crummy films, but always trying to sneak in, uh, you know, more artistic uh, tendencies. 
Uh, his most famous film is Detour, the classic film noir made for literally no money in just a few days. And it is a brutal dark noir if you've never seen it. Uh, but Man from Planet X is probably his other well-known later film. It's a really interesting, very, um, actually very intelligent sci-fi film from, you know, this period, which you wouldn't think it would be. And uh, yes, you know, the effects really are not that great because it was made very cheaply on reused sets. But it is a very good sci-fi film. And I wanted to rewatch it, so I figured I'd uh, check it out on Laserdisc. And the benefit of this set is you get three extra films. Uh, Red Planet Mars is an interesting film that I've read about, but I don't know if I've ever seen it all the way through. Um, and then there's Monster That Challenged the World, which is in the uh, genre of, you know, the giant puppet monsters uh, attacking cities. Um, and this one, I think it's a, um, it's like a, a pupil moth thing that comes out of the sea i think i saw part of it as a kid once i've seen it included in clips and like some of the other um you know 50 sci-fi horror documentaries like you know giving examples of things but i don't even know if i've seen it all the way through so i guess that'll be fun and then last but not least is it the terror from beyond outer space which is the film that inspired alien uh, so much so that a lot of people call alien a remake of it which i could understand because you have the you know, they land on a mysterious planet and this alien creature gets on the ship and starts killing them off one by one. And yes, that's totally alien. So um, I, I saw it once a long, long time ago and you can see the similarities, but it's also entertaining in sort of its uh, cheesy old fashioned way. Um, so it'll be, it'll be fun to rewatch it. And uh, this is a nice little set they put together. You know, they included what uh, theatrical trailers they had, digital mono for all of them. You know, they're, the prints are a bit cleaned up and stuff. And they give you nice little liner notes for each, which was pretty cool. Because at this time, you know, it was very difficult to get anything like that, uh, especially on Laserdisc. So um, they were actually, you know, trying to cater to the, um, you know, hardcore collectors at this point, which was a, which is a pretty cool thing to do. Of course, this has been MGM box set, so you just get a big old load of discs tucked in a box with a complimentary piece of foam. No inserts, unfortunately, but you do get the nice rear cover here. So this is a nice set if you do manage to come across it. They did do a second volume, but of course that is uh, much more difficult to come by and a lot more expensive. <laughs> All right, so I saved the best one for last simply because I've always wanted to pick this thing up and I'm so glad I did because the quality on this box alone and the printing, uh, again, like the those Orion uh, post disc I just talked about, it really shows somebody at the studio really loved these films because this is just really well done. This is the uh, MGM UA distributed by Image box set under the title of MGM Horror Classics. This containing four uh, of the classic early, early horror films. Uh, of course, uh, two of them are, um, well, no, technically one, the Mask of Fu Manchu is the only one that's technically pre-code uh, because all the others are, you know, um, post-1934 after the production code. But what makes these interesting is that all of them are extremely dark and extremely strange for coming out of MGM of all places, which shows that even MGM wanted to try and get on the horror bandwagon when that was a thing. And, uh, you know, they were willing to, you know, shake up the usual bright, more stars than in the heavens, MGM, everything is perfect image, just because something might be popular. So yeah, we'll do some of these horror things. Um, of course, talking about these films, Mask of Fu Manchu is, uh, is an interesting case because you have Karloff playing Fu Manchu, um, you know, which Karloff doing anything is a joy to watch, but um, I think it was in the 1970s, it got hit with a lot of complaints about being, you know, um, extremely insensitive to Chinese culture, as a, a, a lot of the original Fu Manchu stories were, you know, deemed extremely racist and extremely offensive even back when they were written which I can completely understand. But apparently what MGM did in the 70s was then literally uh, cut this 1932 film up and remove giant chunks. And so then we had this sh short version for years. And um, I'm not sure if this Laserdisc version is the reconstructed version. I know it was reconstructed for DVD, um, but I haven't been able to verify yet because I haven't had a chance to watch these all the way through if this is still the kind of mangled cut up version or if it is the reconstructed version. 
I think they cut out like 20 or 30 minutes of it. Um, like different scenes combined added up to about 20 or 30 minutes. Um, all that being said, you know, when you see the whole thing, it's not the best film, uh, but it's got a lot of interesting things in it. And of course, you know, seeing Karloff and sort of the, you know, prototype mad evil doctor with all of his, uh, you know, uh, various torture rooms just being super malicious and, you know, like <laughs> like the stereotypical villain that you would picture. And he he does have a lot of fun with it. So so that that is that is fun to watch, but I can understand and I totally get the, the criticisms about it. So that is something to understand. I'd say of the four films in this set, it is definitely the weakest. Uh, but, you know, it, it does have things in it that are, are fun to watch, but you got to, you know, take into account all of the, uh, you know, controversy that caused the film to be cut in the 70s. Um, the real winner here is Mad Love. Mad Love is probably the great, not talked about 30s classic horror film. It could easily fit in with the universal horrors very easily. Uh, it was uh, directed by Carl Freund, who of course directed The Mummy and shot Dracula, and even had some uh, cinematography done by Greg Toland himself, arguably, you know, the great cinematographer. Um, and was Peter Lorre's first big major American role, and of course he just runs with it. Uh, you also have Colin Clive from uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein and uh, so basically it feels like a universal horror film but it's made over at uh, MGM and it's just a fantastic piece of work. It's technically a remake of The Hands of Orlock which was done as a silent film over in Germany first uh, but it has so much other stuff thrown in there that it's it's really great and it's its own story and um, it, even though it's not like a straight up all out and out horror film, it does have moments in it that must have been really out there and hard for audiences of 1935 to swallow. So it is it is fantastic. And I'm really excited to see it on Laserdisc. Mark of the Vampire is interesting because it's uh, Todd Browning uh, working with Bela Lugosi again. And even though he his character is silent, you know, it's the first time we see him essentially in the Dracula cape again. Uh, unfortunately, it's really a remake of London After Midnight. So, um, you know, it, eventually it, it's revealed to kind of sort of be like a drawing room murder mystery instead of being a straight horror film. And it's kind of weirdly staged. Like it, when you when you watch it, it's it's a very strange watch. It's got a lot of very stagey, silent moments. So you can tell, you know, Todd Browning still at this point liked his usage of silence, which I actually like in his uh, 1931 Dracula, unlike a lot of people. Um, but it's it's really a strange watch. Um, and if you read the plot summary of London After Midnight, the famous lost film that he made with Lon Chaney Sr., uh, you can see that Mark of the Vampire is totally a remake. <laughs> it's the same plot. Um, so, uh, yeah, but it is interesting to see, you know, Lugosi creeping around still being all with uh, you know, just completely dominating over the camera. Um, the other winner here is The Devil Doll, also, also directed by Todd Browning, and it's a very, very strange film. It's really, it's like a revenge film with elements of horror and science fiction. Uh, imagine if you uh, blended The Incredible Shrinking Man with the 30s universal horror um, and then add in elements of the classic silent, The Unholy Three, where Cheney Sr. Uh, disguises himself as an old lady to uh, escape the cops. Whereas in this film, Lionel Barrymore, of all people, disguises himself as a kindly old lady because he's broken out of Devil's Island and he's after revenge to kill the people that put him there. But instead of killing them, he's going to use a uh, mysterious, secret, uh, scientific uh, method cooked up by some crazy people out in the middle of nowhere uh, to shrink them to tiny little um, manipulable, um, essential, essentially miniature zombies that he can control, little tiny remote control people. Um, and that's the, uh, el the uh, vehicle of his revenge. So it is a very strange film with some really, really good effects for the time period, um, you know, and really great extended passages of silence. And uh, it's got some really, really creepy moments in it. So it's a very, very weird film. Again, all of these films are weird and strange. So they do go together in an odd way. 
And they were all repackaged together by Warner Brothers as part of the uh, Legends of Horror box set, which is a DVD set that also brings in the uh, pre-code two-strip Technicolor horror Dr. X and then the uh, sequel in name only strange film Return of Dr. X, which infamously has Humphrey Bogart as a uh, blood-hungry zombie brought back to life dude with a streak of white in his hair, a halting voice, pale skin, and he carries around a white bunny rabbit so if you've ever seen that weird still that's where that comes from but anyway uh, this laser disc just has the four and the box set is really really well done the box is really thick and sturdy and it has the the motif of this spiral in the back I guess to make it look strange and uh, I, I like the black with blood red accents I think that fits really well now as you can see uh, it's going in Uh, rough order and then uh, all the sites kind of run in together and then at the very end you actually have the surviving trailers for uh, the films all tucked in as sort of a uh, theatrical trailer archive for the four films so anyway uh, it was nice they included the uh, surviving theatrical trailers they did have unfortunately there's no extras or commentaries or anything on here Uh, if you pick up the dvd versions of these and the Legends of Horror box set from Warner Brothers, there are one or two commentaries that are pretty good, uh, but not a whole lot of extras outside of that. So this is just a really, really nice set. It was the first time these films had been paid any attention really on home video. And uh, you could tell somebody really, this was a pet project for them because it's a wonderfully put together box set and just really, really well done. Um, Of course, no special insides or anything, just a bunch of discs and a nice foam insert as usual, but really, really beautiful quality on this box set. And of course, they all have PC on mono tracks. And um, at least for, um, actually, I think for all four of these, I think the DVDs mostly share the same transfer anyway. None of them have been uh, cleaned up or remastered for HD or anything or had new scans. And uh, Mad Love especially needs to be on Blu-ray at some point. Um, I'd also argue for the Devil Doll at least if you only were going to do certain ones out of the four. Uh, But all four are really interesting watches. And this is just a wonderful, wonderful box set from MGM, UA, and uh, Image, of course. Because by this time, Image was handling their uh, laser disc department. So now we're going to go through another mystery box sent by Melinda McClure. And once again, my deepest thanks for sending some really, really interesting titles. And uh, the first one, going chronologically, is the remastered widescreen of The Odd Couple, which is one of these really nice uh, Paramount mid-90s widescreen reissues of titles that were previously only pan and scan. Uh, It does have a digital mono track pressed by Pioneer and uses original artwork on this yellow background and you get the remastered widescreen banner of the other Paramount releases. And like the rest, these are not super common. So really these are the best versions out there on Laserdisc. They didn't get another one after this. And they're really nice discs that were pretty much uh, ported over for their first DVDs. So you get a nice PCM monotrack and you get the film in widescreen. There's no special features or anything, but uh, this is just one of those really nice discs that actually get the films out in widescreen. So I can't recommend these Paramount widescreen discs. Or, uh, I can't recommend them enough, really, because, uh, you know, their DVDs were ports and Paramount's DVD uh, operations really were never the greatest. So um, the laser discs actually hold up very, very well. I think the DVD may have a few extras. And it's since had reissues, but uh, if you're curious about getting this on Laserdisc, this is the copy you'll want to seek out. So I've wanted to pick this up to check out the uh, mono track for some time. I've just never found one, so super happy to be able to check it out finally. Next up from 1971 is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, Warner Brothers letterbox reissue for the 25th anniversary. Uh, nice custom artwork. I really like the usage of color and the layout and everything. And they do actually indicate it's widescreen, which you can barely tell because the printing is very, very, uh, that doesn't really stick out from the jacket, but it is letterboxed. I think the previous version was like, um, 
I think it was, I can't remember, the, the one before this has the original mono track and I can't remember if it's if it's letterboxed or it's a 133 presentation. Um, but I think all the previous ones were 133, excepting that first laser disc. I can't remember for certain. Uh, this one does give you a brand new stereo mix in uh, Dolby Pro Logic on the PCM tracks. And then the uh, AC3 5.1 is the same mix and you can listen to the film 5.1. Uh, there's also, I believe, this one has a sing-along track, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yes, it has an isolated score track on the analog tracks, and this literally says, the bonus feature, feel like busting out a song, uh, engage the analog track, and just sing to your heart's content. And so, <laughs> I like that they must have a sense of humor in writing that. Uh, you do get the uh, original trailers at the end. And the film's uh, simply a single disc, two sides, and uh, they very nicely indicated where the uh, specific uh, song numbers were for each chapter if you just want to uh, play the song hits and sing along on the analog track, I guess. So um, I'm actually curious to check out the transfer of this. Of course, the color is really important to a film like this. And I'll fire up the AC3 and give it a go. And uh, I've got to pick up the older one anyway for the mono track, so... This will be a fun go through. I don't know if I'll really be singing. I'm not really, it's not really my thing. Never picture myself as a good singer, so. Next up from 1996 is an interesting looking film. I, I, I know I've heard of this song, I've just never seen it. Uh, this is The Substitute, a live home entertainment release pressed by Pioneer, letterboxed with the same sort of uh, widescreen bar as a lot of the other releases they did. Uh, pretty nice looking jacket and again I've never seen this so this will be a complete uh, going in blind experience show you the rear just a simple movie only disc but it has a PCM Dolby surround track and it actually does have Dolby AC3 so um, I'll watch it with that and uh, give that track a go uh, no extras I don't think it doesn't have a doesn't indicate it has a trailer or anything so just a looks like a nice uh, mid-90s thriller that's uh, got a good LD pressing with an AC3 track. So, fire that up. Can't say no to an AC3 track. Next up from 1998, this is a pretty darn late release. This is the uh, film Polly, which is, of course, you know, marketed under the more family entertainment banner, but uh, it is a 98 film. It is a 99 pressing. It does have a uh, 5.1 AC3 track, and it's one of these late dreams work, dream work, and it's one of these late <laughs> DreamWorks releases that uh, has a really nice jacket. It's a little, little sturdier than normal. It's in great shape. And Belinda indicated this has a really, really nice picture transfer. So I'm actually pretty excited to check it out. Uh, she said the color on this is really, really good. Um, of course, this being a late release, it's handled by Image because they seem to have pretty much taken over from everybody at this point. Uh, and again, it has a PCM Dolby surround track with an AC3 as well. So I will fire that up because AC3 is awesome. And I'm interested to check this out. I'll, I'll give any late release I can try a go, um, whether it's a kid's movie kind of like this or something really goofy, you know, just because, hey, it's a late release Laserdisc. So this should be an interesting watch. Of course, it's uh, movie only, no special features or anything. But, uh, you know, anytime you find one of these later releases, there is, you know, the potential to, for it to be a phenomenal laser disc or to be, you know, super crazy rare <laughs> and thus set you back a lot for even a movie you're not too big on. So um, anytime I can come across a late release, I'm excited just to check out the quality at the very least, let alone, you know, have one more of the late release collection. Next up are two Hong Kong titles that I am super thrilled to go through. This one is another that's distributed by Media Asia with their packaging and such. But this is the film Hong Kong 1941 with Chow Yun Fat. Really nice jacket art there. Very, very simple, but printed very well with nice color and everything. So, you know, it's even frameable if you want to do that. And they kept all the logos from going all over the front, which is nice. Also pretty sturdy cardboard, so that's cool. Again, simple back, and you actually get the uh, little blurb about the film printed in English, which is really nice. 
And then I like how they print the little export certificates on the back of their jackets, which is pretty cool. Uh, of course, it's a Japanese, well, it's a Hong Kong disc, plays fine in all NTSC players, has a uh, digital PCM, I think this is mono, as most Hong Kong films are mono. Uh, I think it's Cantonese on the digital tracks and then Mandarin on the analog tracks. And then I do believe, yeah, this does have English subtitles. It also has Chinese subtitles as well. So it's uh, perfectly watchable to a good number of audiences. And I know Melinda indicated this is like actually a rom-com. So I'm actually interested to see what this is like. So this will be a fun watch. I've gotten to where I'll basically watch anything with Chow yun in it anyway. Now next up is another Hong Kong release also from, oh, well, this one's from Mei Ah. Um, I never know if I say that correctly, but the May uh, Laserdisc Company. Um, and this still has, I guess, the original um, stickers on the um, importers and everything, because it's got the Tysing video marketing sticker on it with their old uh, San Francisco address. But anyway, this is for the film My Father is a Hero. And because it's on two discs, they actually give you two different jackets. So this is the uh, first disc. And of course, over in Hong Kong for uh, double disc films, a lot of times they would actually sell these separately. So you'd have to actually buy two separate laser discs to get the entire film. I know it sounds silly, but that's just how it worked over there apparently. So this is My Father's a Hero 1. Uh, pretty nice cover artwork, I have to say, you know, even though it's in the photo montage style that's very that was and still in a lot of ways kind of is very popular in the uh, Eastern markets. Um, again, there's the Tai Seng sticker on there. Let me show you the back. Again, pretty nice, and you get the uh, export certificate there. I, hope, I, I don't know why. I guess that was maybe some legality they had to do, um, but I just I really like that for some reason. Uh, it does have PCM, I believe. Again, it, I believe it's mono. Uh, it is bilingual, so I believe this does have the uh, English subtitles, probably some Chinese ones as well. And again, it's probably uh, Cantonese on the digital tracks and uh, Mandarin Chinese on the analog tracks. And then, of course, you can't be without part two of the same film. <laughs> so here's My Father is a Hero 2, again with the Tai Seng sticker. And I, I do like that they changed the cover art up a little bit. So, you know, it's at least, you know, um, more imagery instead of just the same jacket reprinted. Show you the rear. And they go together, so you know you can have them side by side, and they fit just fine. Um, but yeah, so this is basically just the second disc of the same film. So instead of doing a gatefold, they would just have two different jackets printed. And again, this is one I've not seen, so I am super excited to spin through this and have a go. I just never thought I'd, I'd come across, let alone own any of these. Um, Hong Kong export discs, so this is always really exciting. And it's always super cool to see, you know, how, how they did things in, you know, foreign territories. If you're primarily, if you're like me, and you're primarily just, uh, you know, collecting US discs and a couple Japanese ones here and there. Now this one I am actually particularly excited about. I've realized I've not seen too many of the classic movie serials, and I'd really like to see more of them. But, you know, it becomes difficult because a lot of them fell into public domain and they weren't treated well and were in, you know, pretty bad shape. So the transfers are kind of all over the place. And then some have multiple different, uh, you know, DVD editions. Uh, very few have actually come out on Blu-ray. But even those usually aren't that perfect uh, because these were run to death over and over and over again. And, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily kept at each studio um, that produced them because a lot of times they would just let the rights lapse. Um, but anyway, it had never really dawned on me that a lot of them actually might have made it to Laserdisc. So um, I was super excited to find this in the mystery box. And uh, cause this is one I've been meaning and wanting to see for ages. So this is the Republic release of the classic Adventures of Captain Marvel serial. And uh, Republic actually did a number of uh, serials and they all had similar uh, jackets like this. And so now that I'm finally getting into these more now, <laughs> I've added a ton to my uh, want list on the LDDP. So um, I'm super excited to finally dig into this. Uh, it does have digital PCM mono for all of these. And it does even, as the jacket says, include the original theatrical trailer for these. So you get all 12 episodes. 
uh, spread across four sides and it's just a really nice uh, package from Republic and it seems like they did uh, this same style jacket in release for um, I think at least five or ten maybe more of the classic cereals I know um, they also did some of the Zorro cereals as well so I'm gonna have to try and pick some of those up too so again, uh, I think this was the first time that this cereal and many of the others actually got good releases. There were also a couple released on tape around this time by like uh, Columbia and a few others. So at least they were finally being treated a bit better. Uh, the Fleischer Superman cartoons also got their first really good official releases on tape and Laserdisc around this time period as well. Um, so before this, all you had were, you know, the first terrible public domain tapes. And then when I was growing up, I didn't know about any of these and it would just be bad public domain prints shown on late night television or those, uh, you know, compilation videotapes of cartoons and old public domain stuff that I would buy as a kid and not know what the heck all this stuff was. And uh, sometimes the elements would be great and most of the times they'd be so bad you couldn't even see what was going on. Um, so really excited to dig into this and uh, was super happy to find this in the mystery box. Now last but not least, two animated titles. Now this one is well, it's more, of course, of, an, of a live action animation hybrid, and it's not super rare, but it does have a bit of um, a bit of desirability. So it's usually pretty difficult to find one. And this was actually one of the first laser discs I ever read about having uh, transfer differences. So I always meant to pick one up, but I just never found one that didn't have like a uh, marked up price tag on it. So anyway, this is the Warner Brothers letterbox pressing of Space Jam. And again, not a super rare laser disc or anything, but it's usually one that just eludes you because you're trying to, you know, get a decent copy at a decent price. It does have a really nice glossy jacket. And again, Warner's actually told you it's widescreen, which is cool. Uh, they put it out under their family entertainment banner. So I also think that meant that all the lasers they put out under that banner, they didn't print as many uh, because they were primarily focused on the VHS market. So it's very easy to get uh, Warner family uh, releases on VHS. You can get them at most any thrift store. But actually finding the Laserdisc variant versions, whether it's Space Jam or especially the animated Batman direct videos, like especially Sub-Zero is the hardest one along with the Batman Superman movie. Um, it's just like they didn't print as many. So again, it's just a movie only disc and uh, you get the film with a PCM digital um, Dolby surround encoded track. But the real draw here is the fact that the AC3 is you know, supposed to have a pretty good kick to it. Um, one of the first things I ever read about LaserDisc was that uh, the Space Jam LaserDisc 5.1 AC3 was so much better than the DVD that you know you had to keep your laser disc and it kicked the DVD's butt. So I read that so many times that I'm like, well, I'll have to find that one day. And so now I finally have. <laughs> it's taken me quite a while, but um, so I, I am very curious to fire this up and check it out. Um, I don't have the DVD, but if it is indeed a you know a super ballsy AC3 track. I might just have to track down that DVD just to do a quick comparison, just out of cur just for curiosity's sake. Um, so it's the AC3 track that really makes this desirable. Um, if you're a big fan of the film and you, you're into laser discs, you're probably already looking for a copy anyway. Um, but yeah, the AC3 would be the reason to pick this up specifically. I think the DVD uses the same transfer as this. And of course, this is also a uh, film from, I believe it's 97. And so that would, you know, make this a later pressing, which of course uh, should mean that the transfer quality is really great on this. So it'll be fun to fire up and then check and see how the, um, you know, live action animation hybrid transferred over onto Laserdisc. And last but not least, uh, the second and final animated title. Um, this is one I've tried to get for a very long time. It is one of the big archive collection box sets. And this one, like a lot of the others, was really intended for the uh, hardcore animation collector, Disney fan, or uh, animation historian. So it is still a pretty important set, even though it was eventually superseded by the uh, really same volume released in the um, archive collection DVD tens and of course those DVDs are out of print as well and go for a pretty decent dollar amount so this is the 
exclusive archive collection release of the Mickey Mouse black and white years uh, listed as volume one, but I don't ever think they did a volume two on Laserdisc. Uh, gorgeous cover, and of course this goes along with all the other archive releases, so you can put them all side by side and they all match. And uh, as you can see, this copy was still actually sealed, so it has the original price tag of $124.99 on it, which is pretty pretty staggering to think about these days. But you know, that's that's what these beautiful box sets would have cost you back in the day when they were brand new. Um, and so it was just just a whole fact of life you had to live with until you could eventually maybe get a copy, um, you know, marked down or on sale or used. Um, so again, really, really wonderful quality on this. Very thick, very heavy. Uh, as you can see, the rear matches the other archive releases as well, and you keep the gold banner motif. Uh, again, this was the first real major release of the classic early uh, Mickey shorts, um, and uh, it was also, I think, the first time they attempted to really try and do any sort of cleanup on them. They have a digital mono track, and then... Um, I think the analog tracks are mono as well, and there may be some of the supplementals that are on some of the analog tracks, because Disney did a lot of that at the time for these. The whole set, I, it's, it's a CAV set. I don't know if any of the final sides with extras might be CLV, but let me slip this out for you. Again, just beautifully packaged, very, very thick fine box material. Now here is the wonderful insert, beautifully printed and embossed like the outer box is. Wonderful liner notes with just gorgeously uh, reproduced photos, full color, fantastically printed. And again, you know, this the, you can tell this was really designed to, you know, promote the uh, history of the company, the legacy of these productions, and the importance from a uh, historical and artistic standpoint for these. And of course, this is the type of stuff you will never get with um, DVD or Blu-ray, sadly. Now I have read some reviews of uh, uh, from some Disney sites and stuff that compared this to the um, tin DVDs, and apparently those underwent a uh, like a second cleanup attempt. So they probably are going to be a bit cleaner in picture and sound than these the first go around for Laserdisc. Um, and I do believe those also because it's two volumes on DVD, so those will have all of the extra shorts that are not on this Laserdisc set because they only did this one volume. Uh, however, those DVDs are of course out of print and go for quite a decent dollar amount. I know I've seen them go for anywhere between uh, 50 and $60 or more per volume, and there's two of them. So um, if you're just interested in these, uh, you can get the Laserdisc set um, for you know a, a bit less than that, but it's still not super common. But it's such a wonderfully produced um, set anyway, I definitely recommend it to most anybody. And then there's the rear. Now let me try and give you a brief overview of some of the extras on here. I can't really read it upside down. <laughs> um, okay, yes, yeah, so each of the um, shorts is laid out across 10 sides and then some of the uh, sides end in a supplemental section, which is primarily uh, collections of story sketches that they had found in the vault. Um, I believe that is pretty much, yeah, it's pretty much all story sketches at the end of each, uh, of most of the 10 sides. And then, um, then there's also footage of the 1932 Oscars, which was entitled Parade of the Award Nominees. So I think it was a, uh, a bit of animation done for the 1932 Oscars. So, okay, yes, yes it is. And it was the first color animation of Mickey Mouse ever done, thought lost for some time. So that was, was a real treasure found for this set. And again, you know, if, if you're wanting to have even more extras and all of the other shorts, you'll have to track down the two uh, DVD volumes in those tins. But of course, that's uh, easier said than done. Now, once the booklet is out, you get the customary foam insert and then the five discs tucked in here. I 
you get the nice exclusive archive collection label. And then, oh, this is pretty nice. They're in, put in the classic elephant comms, but then underneath it to pad it out, that you actually have uh, full on laser disc protection sleeves. That is something I have not actually seen in a box set before, having uh, both versions. And these are all polylined actually. So yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, yeah, and I just op I just opened this, so this is how it was sent, sealed from the factory. So I don't know why they wouldn't have just put them in the poly sleeves to begin with, but that's a really nice touch. And as you can see, they're marketed under being laser disc protectors. So um, I guess the idea was to you know keep these in your own personal library, vaulted away and safe. So. That is a exceptionally nice touch. Again, not something they had to do and um, just shows, you know, they were really trying to do this release up right back in the day. I think I'll have to switch those over to <laughs> the polyline sleeves anyway, just to take advantage of that. Saves me the trouble of buying some extra ones. <laughs> So anyway, that will do it for the uh, second uh, mystery box from Melinda. Thanks again, Melinda, so much for uh, sending these wonderful gems over and giving me a lot of fun opening up and checking out the mystery boxes. Um, that's also going to do it for this video upload. Uh, thanks very much for watching, everybody. I hope it... Uh, gave you some insight into some different discs and pressings and such, and uh, stay tuned for some new uploads.